everybody. I cannot believe at long last I'm able to say these words, but she is back. I am delighted that my 1996 Toyota Celica GT4 is once again resident on my drive. I'm sure a whole bunch of you are very, very happy about this, and I'm sure an equal number of you are also completely and totally befuddled by this announcement, and I wouldn't blame you for not realising that I even owned this car. So, to bring everybody up to speed, allow me to wind the clock back a little bit and tell you what's gone on, and then I'll tell you what's happened since the last video with this car. I've always wanted a Celica GT4, although it's probably more accurate to say that I always wanted a car that wore the Castrol livery. It's a Gran Turismo thing. I thought that meant a Supra, but as I looked into it a little bit more, I realised that actually the Celica was probably the car for me. My grandfather had a Celica when I was younger, so the names always meant something a little bit to me. And in case you're watching from America, yes, Celica is how we pronounce it. We don't say Celica. My granddad's car was nothing particularly special. It was a fifth generation, so the one before this with the pop-up headlights, and it was a two-litre petrol automatic, as best I recall. But that was a very special car to me as a kid, because that was Grandad's sports car. It was a treat to go out in the Celica. And I always looked at these in the classifieds and thought about buying one, but I thought they were a bit too much money, and then they started going up, and I decided I probably should get one before they did what most Japanese stuff does, and just skyrocket in price. Two and a half years ago, I finally bit the bullet, I had a little bit of money that had come in from selling another car, and I decided to buy what was a dream car of mine. This coincided roughly with, can you believe it, 25,000 subscribers on the channel. The car that I bought stood out for a couple of reasons. First off, the advert was really good, as very clear the car had been looked after by some of its previous owners, and some of the real key issues had been tended to, all the bits of suspension that are well known for wearing out had been replaced, and the car had been thoroughly and completely rust-proofed for the last sort of five or six years, and that, with old Japanese stuff, is a crucial thing to do. Unfortunately, when I went to go and see the car, it turned out the seller hadn't been entirely honest with the condition of it, and some of the photos he'd used were actually about four or five years old. And so the car had worn in a few areas and wasn't quite as good as I wanted, but it was my dream car, and most importantly, it had a pretty good history with it, the previous owner keeping some documents and a little USB stick that traced all of the spend on it. So I thought, sod it, I'll buy it. It was priced maybe a little bit over what it was worth, but not so far as to be taking the mickey, and I got my dream Celica. However, the dream didn't stay a dream for very long, because within a few minutes of getting into the car for myself, I was unable to test drive it because I didn't have the insurance policy that I do now, I realised that the gearbox needed some work, there was an oil leak in the engine, and the car was a bit tattier than I really had realised. The owner didn't really seem to care about any of this, and I decided that the best thing I could do would be to try and enjoy the car, and as and when I could afford to, do up the things that needed doing. A few months later, the car then decided it didn't want to boost properly anymore, so I figured that the best thing to do would probably be to stop using it in case I caused any unwanted harm. Back then, YouTube was certainly not a money-making enterprise for me, so doing any work to my cars was not something that I could get done very easily. And so the Celica sat on my driveway, looking rather sorry for itself for quite some time, and I, I just couldn't really bear to look at it anymore. So, in winter of 2019, I got in touch with Ashley, who's a friend of the channel, and he dabbles in amateur restoration to a reasonable standard. He's not a professional car restoration shop, but he also doesn't charge professional car restoration shop prices, and the intention was that the procedure was going to take a little while to then give me the time needed to earn the money to pay for it all. However, in March 2020, things went a bit wrong for everybody, and so the project got put on hold. I didn't really know what was going to happen, Ashley wound up getting locked out of his workshop where the car was, and things all just kind of ground to a halt. As 2020 progressed, it turned out that YouTube actually was doing quite well, and I suddenly started to earn money, which meant that my appetite for fixing this up returned. That's just as well, because things didn't go quite according to plan, I think that's pretty typical for any restoration work. The company who was supposed to be painting 
getting it, decided they didn't want to. Nothing to do with the car or with me. It was something really, really quite silly. So I had to source another paint shop to do that and use Paintmaster over in Telford. We sent the car over. Originally, we were going to put a new front bumper, new wings and things on it, but I looked at those and I decided they, they just weren't really that good. The biggest issue for me with the car was that it was advertised as having had a full glass out respray. However, when I looked at the documentation that came with it, I found out it had in fact got a partial respray instead. Though it looked fine in the five year old photos used to sell it, by the time I got to it, you could see whether the paint was original or not, and the car was 50 shades of white. I decided therefore that the only way forward was to start again with the paintwork and get it all the same. So when it did eventually go off to Pro Repair, they did a very thorough job, including fixing some old repairs, making sure the potential corrosion was kept at bay, and we even sorted out the overspray on the window trims from the previous spray job. And now the car looks absolutely sensational. And now it's back. Is it perfect? No. But am I having fun? Yes. This generation of GT4 is the direct precursor to the current Yaris GR4, so it's a car that a lot of people are actually talking about right now. Unfortunately, as you probably hear, mine still has a few issues, the gear shift being the biggest one. We have tried a couple of things, but it would appear that the problem is within the box. It's going to need a rebuild. Fortunately, that's not too expensive. There is an outfit out there called MK Tuning. The guys are specialist in these things, and he's actually worked on this exact car in the past. So I'm going to try and get in touch with him soon. I know he's very, very busy, and he's a little bit old school. He doesn't really do emails or anything. And the aim is to build a list of all the stuff on here that needs doing, and I'm going to send it down to him over winter and then have the next round of stuff done. I'm going to try and enjoy it as much as I can in the meantime. If you're gentle, no, no, not if you're gentle with the gear shifts. Third, if you're gentle, that actually works okay. But fourth, it is just really not happy at all. I am slowly getting back in tune with this car. In reality, I, I never really got to experience it that much properly before it went away. When it came to me, it was on old Yokohama Parada Spec 2s, which were in the wet pretty lethal, and that was most of the time that I had the car. It's now got newer Yokohama V105s on it, which are much better. I actually really like the V105, and I do like putting Japanese rubber on Japanese cars. This also is a spectacular thing. Whilst the interior may be sort of very vinyl-tastic uh, 1990s interior, it's a special car, mostly because of that amazing view out the front. You can see that little intake snorkel there, the vents. To me, this is one of the best bonnets ever put on a car. Full stop. I have also taken the time to make a few select upgrades to the car, so the catalytic converter has been upgraded, although we're going to upgrade it again at some point and put in a sort of high flow sport cat. It is currently running a, a decap. I have also fitted a new pair of door cards. The reason for that is I do want to put a nice stereo in this car, because I do intend to use it as much as I can really. So we've now got two speaker slots in here, and I believe you should have a third up here, sort of where the you know, tweeters tend to go on this little triangle here underneath the A pillar. So I haven't got that yet, but I think I can probably buy that section, or I can probably just cut a hole in it and put a tweeter there, so that's okay. I'm not particularly precious about the interior. I mean, it's a Japanese car, you know, they're, they're meant to be modified. When this car came to me, it didn't actually have any speakers in these door cards at all. The only speakers in it are two behind you. Oddly, it actually works quite well. Although the exhaust on this does look like a, a great big baked bean tin type affair, it's actually not that bad either. I think it's fairly well judged in terms of volume, but I don't like quite how close it is to the bodywork. Now that we've also made some changes to, so there are some spats front and rear, and they, they don't fit great, but from a distance they look okay, and I'm undecided. The rear's quite happy with. Fronts, uh, I'm not so sure, so the jury there is currently out. The biggest and most obvious change, though, is on the back, where I have fitted the great big wing that all of these things really should have. My car came with a three-post spoiler, which I don't actually hate, 
but to me, the Celica GT4 is defined by that classic side profile with that great big rear wing. And it's actually an interesting affair because the official solution for that rear wing is you take the regular two-post spoiler that you had on some of the model years of this car and then you put big riser blocks on. They're the pieces that say GT4 on the side and that gives it the rally car height wing. I really quite like it. From memory, the first year of the GT4 kind of got this as standard, and I think the last year got it as standard, but everything in between didn't. They got the three posts, so to actually fit this, I bought a whole new tailgate because all the holes were drilled in the wrong place in mine. On my list of things to fix is also the gear lever here. I don't actually hate it, it's, it's all right. The action is actually quite nice. When I got it, for some reason, this Mishimoto lever was all wrapped in some weird tape. No idea why, there was nothing actually wrong with it but underneath the lever itself has been kind of butchered, presumably to fit this or, or something else. So that I do want to get fixed, probably quite easy when the gearbox is out of the car. It's not exactly the fastest thing, especially at low RPM. It's a very old school turbo, kind of builds boost and actually you, you rev it out like an NA engine. Redline is about 7,000, give or take, and this car did get dynoed not long before it went in for loads of work, and it made precisely 255 horsepower. It made what it should have done from the factory. It's currently sat on some teen lowering springs, which do lower the car by quite a bit, something like 40 millimeter, I think, from memory. And so it's got a very sort of classic rally car feel. It's actually really, really well damped. On this kind of road, it flows so well. It's a beautiful thing to drive, it really is. Throttle response is actually really good for a turbo engine too. Now we don't actually know exactly what it was that was causing my uneven boost issue, but we replaced lots and lots of pipework in the engine bay, there was a screw that was missing and that could have been responsible. We also put the original air box back on the car, although you can actually still hear it sucking in great big dollops of air, so that's actually something I thought would change but hasn't. We went to take off the blitz dump valve as well, or blower valve, whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, and we did put on a, a blower valve sort of delete plate, uh, courtesy of TB Dev, Timothy Bill Developments. And um, the car apparently didn't like it. I'm going to investigate more because he says that it should actually run okay. So I don't know quite what's going on there. We're going to look into that. Again, this is still very much work in progress. But I am so happy to be behind the wheel of this car again. It actually still feels pretty good and pretty tight. I'm really enjoying it. The ride quality is excellent. Steering feel is wonderful. You know, it takes a little while for you to get used to it, but it weightens up really nicely. And to me, this really is a, a truly iconic car. A lot of people will always associate this with Sega Rally, which is a game I probably spent a little bit too much playing when I was younger, particularly as I had a Dreamcast. Oh, I believe that. I actually won uh, my Dreamcast uh, in a Fantasy Formula One competition, a uh, run, I think, by Special Reserve. If anyone remembers Special Reserve, do get down in the comments and press F, please, because that was a great magazine. I mean, that was every birthday, every Christmas. Special Reserve was this, like, mail-order magazine for games and stuff. And it would come out I don't know, every month or something. And it was just basically like a, a classified ads almost for stuff. And you just highlight stuff that you wanted. And you know, this is before the internet really. You found what you wanted, the prices were all there, you phoned them up, told them, and they sent the stuff out. It was my book of dreams. In truth, this thing is still plenty quick to have fun on the roads. I'm just sort of building back my confidence with it, you know, making sure the car is mechanically decent. And of course, I have spent a lot of time recently with some really really exotic machine and you have to remember this is a car from 25 years ago so I'm just making sure I'm not asking more of it than it could ever possibly deliver but thus far I've been really really very pleased with the Celica I'm not actually sure got brakes on this car actually really good they I think are off the Mark 3 Toyota Supra Turbo so they were always very very good brakes and to be fair to the previous owner one thing he did do was put some decent brakes on this car it's running Carbotech XP8 discs and pads or whatever they are but they're very very good 
Come to think of it, I'm not sure any of you have actually seen this car in motion before. I think because I was just, well, embarrassed about the state of it. I no longer am. It's now all the same shade of white, which is great news. Really, really great news. I'm so happy with this thing. So, so happy. Lots of work to be done. I need to sort of stereo out in here. Um, I still need to sort a few little cosmetic bits out inside here, tidying some trim up, that sort of stuff. I've got a great big car cover in the boot. It's actually a good sized boot in this car. I won't show you a shot of it because it's just jam packed with stuff at the moment. I need to work out what other mechanical bits I want to do. I need to start getting a list together of all the things I want to do with the car. But first and foremost, I just want to get out there and enjoy it because ultimately, that's what it's for. And at long last, I can actually do that. Oh yeah, <laughs> I forgot. The dash also only illuminates half of itself, half of the time in some very weird blue color. That means it's almost impossible to see at night. So that needs fixing. <laughs> oh, the things you remember. That doesn't even bother me anymore. I'm not even mad. So there we go. The Salika is back. Anything you want to know, pop it to the comment section down below. Please like, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.